Welcome to Emerging Languages Camp 2010. Third by Phil McCurio. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to present the third, a, an experimental language I developed as proof of concept and as a research tool. Um, I also just realized this is the third talk. I don't know if you guys planned it that way. Thanks. Um, the motivation is a minimalist visual language, keep it as simple as possible. Programming as much as possible via direct manipulation, so it would work well in a low typing environment like a tablet or a pen based machine. Visualization of code execution as um, part of debugging. The notion of code behind the interface. Um, I won't be able to talk too much about this, unfortunately, more than on paper. Um, but that's the notion that given the user interface element, you can navigate from there to where the code that controls that ele element is. And also self-modifying or reflective visual language, uh, specifically as far as that might be interested in, interesting in implementing machine learning. And I'll talk about that briefly at the end. So, stack, so third is a stack-based interpretive language. It's functional, concurrent, visual, and reflective. I'll talk today about prior work a little bit. Then I'll present the key concepts in the language. I'll um, concentrate on four uh, example programs. And then I'll talk about uh, future work a little bit. Now on the bottom is a link to uh, a paper that corresponds to this that has whatever I can run talking about today. Uh, the user interface in third was inspired by small talk, just like everybody else, and self, both very minimalist systems, also systems demonstrating inspecting and modifying code within the interface. And down here, Boxer, which was developed in the early 80s at UC Berkeley. Somebody else put here. Um, it demonstrated hyperprogramming of code as hypertext in next two boxes, and also the notion of code behind the interface. That's really where I got that from. Uh, from the spreadsheet, I stole the notion of the grid as both user interface and data type. Um, you could also argue that uh, Excel is the most popular per, uh, programming language currently in use by an order of magnitude. Other systems that uh, stretch the spreadsheet paradigm one way or another, ThingLab, Spreadsheet 2000, uh, Forms 3, LizCell, and Subtext. Subtext will actually be presented here today, uh, tomorrow. So. From the language point of view, third is most like fourth, um, so, <laughs> you just got it. Okay, you just got it. Um, uh, it's a very minimal language. Uh, it's also like Joy, uh, which is the functional cousin of Fort, adds functional programming to the Fort model. And Befunge, <laughs> and other two dimensional programming languages. Um, third is essentially a Funge, but hopefully it's a little bit more readable. <laughs> The fundamental unit in third is the cell. A cell may or may not be located in a grid. It may have neighbors. A cell can either be atomic, in which case it has a single textual value. Everything in third is a string. But cells do have types associated with them. The types are used to control how the value is interacted with and displayed. It doesn't constrain the value. Everything is a string. Non-atomic cells contain a grid of subcells. Uh, the grid expands as needed. Not all locations have to be filled. This is two-dimensional, but conceptually could be extended to more dimensions. The uh, entire space of cells is called third space. And uh, there's one root cell at the top, which is referred to as slash. Everything else is contained under that cell. This is how third displays a grid as a table uh, by default. You can see here um, what looks like the Unix path name, 
This is the path to this cell from the root of third space. Each cell also has a unique ID, and either one can be used to refer to itself. This is uh, zoomed in on a uh, single cell. You can select the type of the cell from a drop down menu. When you view a cell in the grid, they're all viewed as text, all types of viewed as text, except for opcodes or instructions in the language which are viewed as icons. But if you zoom into them, even an opcode is just text. It's just text that's been marked as executable. Some types, like integers and reals, uh, can take parameters, specifying in this case the low, high, and uh, step value. Or if you have a choice of strings, you can specify a list of values for that. Now when I turn on the user interface panels, you can see that a string is edited as text, the number is edited using the spin box, and the choice becomes a drop-down list. These are the default panels, the little custom panels, and by inspecting the panels, you can find out the code underneath, and that's uh, the code behind the interface ID. Within a grid, you can specify a subcell by its coordinates. The coordinates begin with zero, uh, have the uh, I axis horizontal and the J axis vertical in this display. Uh, so that cell outlined in green here, that contains the word two, can be indexed as two one. If the J value is not specified, it defaults to one unless I is zero. So the same value can be indexed as simply two. This mechanism of defaulting with values means that uh, indices means that you can expand this beyond two dimensions. Though. The cells that are i equals zero or j equals zero are called the frame cells. In this particular example, cell zero, zero doesn't exist. The rest of the cells are the content cells. If the frame cells contain text, if they exist and contain text, they can be used to index into the content cells. So this same cell can be indexed as beta English or simply as beta. This addressing scheme makes a third grid essentially a general data type, a union of a variable if it's just a single value. A list of values can be indexed numerically. Add the, add the I frame in and you get a dictionary. Add the J frame in, you get a relation or a table. And a hierarchy can be represented using containment. You can also get from one cell to another cell using relative paths. Um, and starting out at this cell here, the path dot dot refers to the containing grid cell. Uh, plus one plus zero refers to the cell immediately to the east. Minus zero, one plus one refers to the cell immediately to the southwest. And there's also a notation here that allows you to refer to a cell that doesn't exist yet. Plus plus. For relationships other than containment, Cells can be bound together in triples called triads. And this is also where the name third comes from. If you bind cells together in threes. The three corners of a triad are called A, B, and Y. Uh, they're represented as three paths into, the, into third space. But I like to think of it as uh, a directed labeled graph, where A is the head, B is the tail, and Y is the label. So this entire network of triads is essentially a directed labeled graph where the labels can participate as nodes in the graph. When viewing a cell, we can choose to show the triads. And this cell has one triad, and these are the other two corners of the triad that it's, it's attached to it. Each of those are portals to navigate to those cells. So in summary, a cell is a location for a mutable value in third space. It specifies its type and its relationship to other values. One of the things that you can use at, uh, triads for is attributes, uh, specifically for attaching code to a cell. A cell can be attached as either a formula or as an event. In either case, this, the code, the cell that we attach to, is called an anchor cell, or sometimes a result cell. If it's attached as an event, 
And each time I change the anchor cell, the code gets executed, and at no other time. This, cell has, this code has to be incrementing of value in the last cell. A formula is more like a spreadsheet formula. Uh, the value of the computation, the result of the computation is stored in the anchor cell. And each time you change something, uh, the formula gets reevaluated in the cell. Each formula or event has a wave of execution associated with it. Uh, this is the wave viewer down here. It's kind of a cluttered display, but a uh, focus down here. Uh, there are four data, four stacks, three data stacks, and one execution stack. Code begins when a cell is pushed onto the execution stack X. Since that cell. Uh, it contains a value, it's not an opcode, it's simply popped and pushed onto a data stack when it's executed. We then follow a list of relative paths to find the next cell to execute, called the next route. The default uh, route is left to right, top to bottom. So we find this next cell that contains seven, and we push that onto the X stack. That completes one cycle. <coughs> X is executed by popping it and pushing it onto a data stack. We then follow the route again and find the multiplication opcode. When that's executed, it multiplies the value, leaves the answer on the stack. We try to find another cell, we fail, we get one end uh, opcode pushed onto the stack for us by the system. And when they, the end is executed, it pops the value at the top of the A stack and use that to set the value and the type of the result cell. In order to implement higher order functions, we need to be able to quote code. The way we do this is by pushing it into a grid. So these two programs are identical or equivalent. Um, the bottom one, when it's executed, it pushes a six, it pushes this grid, and then the evaluate opcode pops the grid, takes the first cell, pushes it on the X stack, and <laughs> <laughs> And off it goes. So this is the first program I want to show. Uh, this is an average computation. In the middle is the anchor cell for the result. The bottom is the, is the formula. And the uh, top is the input. Each time I execute each time I change one of the values in the input, the formula gets recomputed and the result changes. This code begins by referencing the input cell and making a copy of the reference. And then it uses the higher order function fold, which is like reduce in the map reduce paradigm, uh, to fold in the addition operator into the list, producing the sum of the values in the list. Then we step through the list, incrementing this value here to get the count of the values in the list. We divide, set the type, and we've got the average. This is the, this is the second program here. This is the first uh, simplest thing I can come up with that uh, demonstrates reflection. At the top we have the anchor cell oscillating between minus two and plus two. The program begins by referencing a cell called the heartbeat that's constantly changing. It then drops that value, but because it referenced that cell, every time it changes, this formula gets reevaluated. We then get the anchor cell and either increment it or decrement it. And if you watch that, you can see the program is writing itself, rewriting itself over and over again, changing that between increment and decrement as it gets the values. For a more practical example, we have 99 bottles of beer on the wall. <laughs> um, only nine here because that's all that fit on the slide, but in fact, the number is controlled entirely by that cell in the corner. Here it is running. On the left is the main routine. Down on the bottom, on the right, is a subroutine called bottles that figures out whether to print bottle or bottles, depending on the number when they're finished. If we wanted to understand what's going on in this program, we would stop execution, bring up a wave editor, and start editing the code, dragging some breakpoints into various points. Then uh, we start execution up again. 
and uh, run to the first uh, first stop point. Once we're there, we can drag cells off of the uh, wave viewer to inspect them, drop them out of viewer there. Now we're doing a map operation on this 321 array to turn it into uh, the text we want. Uh, we just finished that, and we can see that it turns to three bottles, two bottles, one bottle. And then we let it play through to the end, and right before the end, we'll go back to the uh, anchor cell so we can see that getting set as the last step. The final program is a uh, tic tac toe AI. The board is over here, some controls here, and this is most of the code, well, a bunch of the code. Uh, while this is running, you can see some more uh, stacks down here. These are the reverse execution stacks. Every operation has an inverse that's pushed onto, their stack, onto that stack, and you can play the code backwards in many cases. You can also see that it's going faster than this stack because each higher order function is causing many lower order functions to get executed. And there are other things that happen. That's one. Um, now, the core of this uh, algorithm is a, a list of eight lines, the three horizontal, three vertical, and two diagonal lines through the board, and two sets of before and after rules that win or block on a row. On a row. Any language that you would implement a tic-tac-toe AI in would probably have the same sort of eight-line array. What's different about third is that array was constructed by direct manipulation, by dragging the cells directly from the board onto the list being constructed to set the <coughs> relationship between the list and the cell locations on the board. Uh, future directions I'd like to take this. Uh, I'd like to continue to improve the UI. It needs a lot of work. Uh, but keeping the focus on direct manipulation. It's basically pen based as much as possible. Minimal thing. The current implementations in Tipple is concurrent, but it's not parallel. So I'd like to do a multi-processor implementation. So the next version, uh, I'm working in uh, an interpreter in Erlang, a browser-based UI in JavaScript, um, or whatever I decide to use it, do it in, and a RESTful interface in between the two. And there's a small REST server in the existing code that scaffolds this development. For the distant um, future, my initial motivation in making a reflective visual programming language was I thought it would be an interesting language to do genetic programming and you know, other evolutionary techniques. Um, I'm particularly interested in programs that are written partially by hand and partially filled in by some machine learning approach like genetic programming or evolutionary programming. So building on the work currently being done in error detection and correction in spreadsheets, my blue sky ideal for this is that a programmer would normally go along specifying positive and negative, negative test cases at various points in the code, and then for some pure portions of the code would say, mark this as to be evolved, rather than I'm going to write it by hand. I'd particularly like to see if uh, programs like uh, the tic-tac-toe AI, if you started them out with the uh, line representation written by hand, and let them evolve the rest of the code, that would be an efficient way to uh, do uh, evolutionary programming. Okay. Uh, again, this is, the paper is online. This is the website of third, and uh, it's just in time. Anybody have some questions? Thank you very much.